Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our second uh, colloquium of the year. Uh, today is my great uh, privilege and pleasure to introduce uh, the speaker, uh, Dr. Meredith McGregor. So Meredith is an assistant professor in the Department of Astrophysical and Planetary Sciences at the University of Colorado Boulder. She's also the associate director of CASA, the Center for Astrophysics and Space Astronomy. Meredith is the co-chair of the NASA Infrared Science Interest Group Leadership Council and a member of the Origin Space Telescope Disk and uh, Planet Formation Working Group. Meredith got her bachelor degree and PhD from Harvard in 2017. She was then an NSF postdoc uh, and Carnegie Fellow at, at Carnegie DTM before joining the University of Colorado in 2020. Um, so Meredith uh, research leverages uh, multi-wavelength observations from X-ray, UV to far infrared, submillimeter and radio to explore the formation and potential habit habitability of planetary systems with a big emphasis on star-disc-planet interactions throughout their formation and co-evolution. She's the PI of countless programs using a very impressive array of facilities across the entire wavelength range from SWIFT, Chandra, HST, ALMA, VLA, SMA, and the list goes on and on and on. <laughs> so today, Meredith will tell us how to form a habitable planet. Meredith, the floor is yours. Swap back mics. Hi, everybody. Um, so it's uh, a real pleasure to get to come here and tell you a bit about my research. Um, I will start with this slide. Um, I've had the great joy of the last two and a half years of building a research group during the pandemic since I started perfectly in my faculty job in January 2020. So I had two months of normal life, and then everything has been chaos since then. Um, but a lot of what I am showing today is not just my work, but the work of my entire group. Um, so I'm highlighting all of my students here. I have four undergraduate students, four graduate students, and a postdoc who've been working with me at CU. And so you'll see their names called out on the slides as I move through. Here's a picture of all of them in our Zoom pandemic group meeting mode. So that's fun. And a lot of the work that we do as a group, as Dimitri sort of already introduced, is I'm an observational astronomer. I will use any telescope that I can convince someone to give me time on. <laughs> so everything from long radio all the way through X-ray wavelengths and using them to really try and understand planetary systems as a cohesive whole. I think that we can't actually understand the planet formation process or planets by themselves unless we think about the environments in which they're growing, the disks, the processing from the star, and the planets themselves. And so here I'm highlighting sort of three of the questions that I've been sort of driving at in my research group, which really niche in this kind of star-planet disk interaction. So trying to understand how we can model and observe structure in planet-forming disks and think about whether that structure is coming from planets or maybe not from planets. Trying to understand how stellar activity actually impacts chemistry and disks, chemistry and planetary atmospheres, and then also trying to just understand how planets inherit their material from these initial disks. You know, how does the volatile and water content from these disks get traced into actual planetary atmospheres that many people are excited about looking at now with JWST. So I have a few slides of introduction because not everybody works on planetary systems. So here's our big picture overview of how we form planets, right? We start with a giant molecular cloud, right, at the top. Oh, pointing the wrong way, right? And then pieces of that cloud become overdense and they collapse to form new young protostars. And those stars are surrounded by disks. And this is what we call a protoplanetary disk. These are the gas-rich, dust-rich environments where we form giant planets and planetary systems. Most of the material from these disks gets cleared away on a time scale that is nebulously referred to here as one to 10 million years. We don't actually understand the time scale of planet formation that well. We know that planets start forming quickly, but we don't actually know how long we have to form them. Eventually, this material gets cleared, and what we're left with is our main sequence star, anything that's left over, which we call a debris disk, and our mature planetary system. So just to draw the distinction between those two different classes of disks a bit clearer, on the left, we have protoplanetary disks. These are all images taken from ALMA with the D-sharp survey. These are pre-main sequence stars. Their disks are very rich in primordial gas, the gas that came originally from that collapse of the interstellar cloud. 
This is really the only time that we definitely have enough material to form giant planets, things like Jupiter. So I like to think of protoplanetary disks as sort of the reservoirs of planet formation. On the right, these are all images of debris disks, right? So these are main sequence stars. They actually do have gas in them, but we think that the gas is likely secondary, produced through cometary collisions, where now we have gotten rid of that initial reservoir of gas, and what we're seeing is actually the result of smashing a bunch of comets together, outgassing this ice. There may still be enough material here to form terrestrial, smaller planets, and so I like to think of debris disks as kind of the fossil record of planet formation, because the structure of these disks actually tells us about the dynamics of the initial planet formation process. Okay, so we can observe planet forming disks at basically any wavelength we want, and Different wavelengths are actually tracing different emission mechanisms. So when we look at optical and near IR wavelengths, we're actually seeing small micron-sized dust grains, and we're seeing scattering of light off of those tiny dust grains. As we move out in the longer wavelength spectrum to things like the mid-IR, the far IR, and the millimeter, we're actually seeing larger dust grains, you know, things like pebbles, that are actually getting heated and now re-radiating thermal emission. So these are four images of the exact same debris disk. This is AUMIC, one of only a few debris disks known around an M-type star. The top image is sphere, so this is near IR, and you can actually see there's waves propagating outwards in the plane of the disk. And the bottom are all thermal images taken with Herschel, Alma, and the VLA all the way out of the centimeter. And so we can now resolve these disks, and we can look at the wavelength-dependent structure and learn about the population of grains, the collisions, and sort of whether the structure varies as a function of wavelength. So a lot of the work that I do uses ALMA, which is the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter sub Array, which was built in Chile just about a decade ago now. And ALMA has a total of 66 antennas in it, and they're reconfigurable, right? So you can see it in this compact configuration down the Atacama Desert. The longest baselines from ALMA are about 16 kilometers, which means we can image these disks with a resolution of just a hundredth of an arc second. So I like to show this gallery where we start with our images of debris disks taken pre-ALMA. And you might be looking at this and saying, mm, it's not that interesting, there's a lot of blobs. You can tell that some of these are disks, but it's not a particularly exciting gallery of images. And here are all the exact same disks now imaged with ALMA. So if you sort of flash back and forth between them, you can see things that just look like blobby structures are now resolved as multiple rings. We see gaps, we see eccentricities, we see asymmetries in these systems. And so ALMA has really kind of opened this entirely new window on really being able to understand planet formation in this high resolution detail. Okay, so I advertised my talk as how to form a habitable planet, which is kind of a big topic to throw out there. So what do I mean by that? We, as astronomers, like to adopt a very simple definition for habitability, which is often this, right, where we say, I think that water is essential for life, and so I want to define habitability as what planets could potentially have the right conditions to allow for liquid surface water on these planets. And that essentially comes down to temperature. If we assume an Earth-like planet with an Earth-like atmosphere, if I move my planet too close to the star, it's too hot, I'll boil away all my water, not so great for life. If I move my planet too far away from the star, it gets really cold and I freeze everything. And that is a functional definition. It's easy to use. It means we can go out and detect exoplanets and roughly quantify whether they might be habitable or not. But I'd argue that the concept of habitability is actually a lot more complex than just thinking about the distance from a star and liquid water, right? There's a lot of different factors that I might throw out there and be curious about if I really want to understand whether something's habitable or not. I might care about the size of the planet, I might care whether it has plate tectonics or a magnetic field, or is it star active? In our own solar system, we think that outer giant planets were really critical in that they stirred up dynamics in the early solar system, which initially actually delivers water to our Earth, because our Earth formed within the snow line of our solar system, so it shouldn't have had any water at all. And it's Jupiter actually migrating that kicks all these comets in and asteroids in to deliver water. But then Jupiter actually clears a lot of things and it protects Earth from having impactors later in its evolution. So if I really want to say I'm going to understand habitability, I don't think it's good enough to just go out there and look for the right temperature of an exoplanet. 
but we really want to try and get at some of these factors. And so this is where I try and structure my research to place some constraints on these things from other parts of planetary systems that we can actually observe. And so I'm going to highlight sort of two areas to start in my talk here. One, whether we can say anything about the outer regions of planetary systems. And two, if we can say anything about the stellar activity. So let's start with that first question, which is, do we know whether out planetary systems have outer giant planets? That sounds like a really basic question to ask, but it's actually kind of a tricky one because the way that people typically detect exoplanets are our techniques here on the left, right? We have radial velocities where we're looking for a planet to tug on a star. We have transits where we're looking for a planet to transit, and we have direct imaging where we actually can detect light from the planet itself. And here is the landscape of exoplanets that we've detected, right? So this is mass and period, and they're color-coded by the type of detection technique. And I overlaid on this are our solar system planets. And what is immediately obvious is that we're missing giant chunks of this plot. So our current understanding of exoplanets cannot actually tell us whether there are Jupiter and Uranus and Saturn analogs in the majority of planetary systems. And if we think that's important, then that's a big gap. So how do we fix that? Because you know the transit time you'd have to sit and look for Neptune to transit is decades, and we haven't even known about exoplanets for long enough to be able to do that. So my interest is from the planet formation perspective, because planets are embedded in these disks, and they shape these disks gravitationally. So if you stick a planet down in a dust disk and allow it to orbit, it's going to perturb the orbits of those planetesimals and dust, introduce a lot of really interesting structures. And ideally, we might be able to go with ALMA and observe those structures and then try and understand how they formed and use that as a way to start trying to place some constraints on what's happening in the outer regions of planetary systems. And to motivate that that's not an insane thing to say, here's two examples where this kind of works. This is Beta Pictoris, which is a well-known debris disk that has a directly imaged planet in it. And the Beta Pictoris disk actually has a warp in the inner part of the disk where the disk is kinked. And that kink comes from the orbit of this planet. And a little bit closer to home, this is our Kuiper belt. Our own Kuiper belt is a debris disk. It's remnant material from the formation of our planetary system. And if you look at the classical structure of our, the classical members of our Kuiper belt, they've actually gotten swept into resonances with Neptune, where Neptune early in our solar system's history actually moved outwards and it sort of confined all of these bodies in this rather narrow, confined belt. Okay, so what does it look like when we go out and we actually look at other disks and try and understand their structure? So I'll start with Fomalhaut, which is this beautiful disk, first imaged by Hubble, um, and has this narrow ring. There was even a tentative detection of a protoplanet, Fomalhaut b. But then that became controversial because Fomalhaut b appears to be on some orbit that crosses the disk. And later observations show that Fomalhaut b might not be there at all. But the disk is actually noticeably eccentric. And it's significantly eccentric. It has an eccentricity of like 0.1. So we went with ALMA to try and actually observe this disk in the millimeter to try and trace sort of the larger dust grains in the system. And this is what the ALMA image looks like. And you can now see even more clearly how eccentric this disk is. The star is detected as this sort of orange dot here, right? And the pink cross is exactly where the center of the disk would be if I just sort of said, where is the center of this ring? And so the disk is eccentric enough that we see an offset between the stellar position and the actual centroid of the disk. What's particularly interesting about this disk is that it's actually brighter at the apocenter side of the disk farther from the star than at the pericenter side. And this is something that we call apocenter glow. And it was theoretically predicted, but we'd never actually observed it before. So if you remember back to Keplerian dynamics, objects on Keplerian orbits actually move slower at apocenter, right? Sweeping out equal areas in equal times. That means that they spend more time in their orbits at apocenter. And we'd actually predict that there should be a surface density enhancement at the apocenter side of the disk. And so this is exactly what we see with ALMA. We see this brightening at apocenter because when we look 
and millimeter wavelengths, we're assuming this is optically thin emission, so we're sensitive to the surface density of material. We can push that further, actually, and say that if there really is a planet sculpting this disk, I would expect the width of the disk to not actually be the same all the way around the disk, right? It's going to vary azimuthally. You imagine planet might make the orbits be what we call absidally aligned, where they sort of nest at their pericenter point and then have these orbits that extend out in apocenter. So we might predict that the width should actually vary. And by looking for that width variation, which we can do with ALMA, we can actually place some interesting constraints in the dynamics of the system. So what I'm flashing over here on the right are new ALMA observations, which have even higher resolution down to about 1 AU resolution than I did show it on the previous slide. And they're flashing overlaid between the apocenter and pericenter side of the disk. And you can actually see this change in the width and the change in the surface density profile between the pericenter and the apocenter sides of the disk. So we can look with ALMA at such high resolution now that we can really probe the dynamics of this system. OK. Now there's other interesting structures we can look for that are not just eccentricities. So this is a disk um, that was notable in its scattered light imaging because it's actually very asymmetric. The right side of the disk here extends about two times as far away from the star as the left side of the disk, which is sort of puzzling. And people were unsure of what was happening here. One thing was proposed that maybe this was due to an interaction with the interstellar medium, where the disk is actually plowing into a dense interstellar gas cloud and actually causing a ram pressure stripping that's stripping grains away from the disk on one side. So in order to try and figure out what was going on, did the same thing and image this with ALMA. And now what I'm showing is the ALMA image on its own on the right and overlaid as contours on the left. And what was particularly surprising is that the ALMA image looks not a whole lot like the scattered light image. We see no evidence for that asymmetry between the two sides of the disk. And instead, we actually interpret this as being due to two rings of emission, where we have the star and then an inner ring of dust, a gap, and an outer ring of dust. Now, you're probably squinting at this image and saying, that just looks like a bunch of blobs. How can you tell that that's multiple rings? So here's my primer on looking at disks. Okay? You can imagine that your disk is like a donut. Right? It has some hole in the middle of it. If I take the example on the left, this is a face-on donut, and I pick any line of sight through this donut, I'm going to see the same amount of material all the way through. So I would expect, in an optically thin case, to see even contours of emission. Now, if I incline my donut, and I say it's edge on, right, 90 degrees inclination, if I pick a line of sight through the middle, I see donut and then hole and then donut. But if I pick either edge of the disk, I actually see donut all the way through. So I have a higher surface density emission when I project it like this. This is what is physically termed as onsi, or like jug handles, because we expect to see this limb brightening when we see a disk that has a hole in it. So if I go back to this, the center peak here is actually the star. And then you can see these two distinct blobs on either side. And we interpret that as being those onsi, that limb brightening from an inner disk, and then there's a clearing from the gap and then the outer disk. OK, so we have this disk that has a gap in it. What's causing that gap? We can actually, if we interpret it as a planet, try and place some constraints on the planet and its orbital properties and its mass by modeling that gap structure. So the top is basically just taking an analytical approach where I model my gap. I have a radius for it, a depth, and a width, and I can pull out a planet mass. And the bottom is showing rebound simulations. We're actually running n-body simulations to see what happens if I take this 0.16 Jupiter mass planet, I plop it down in a disk of these properties, and I see what it does. And these are, after a million years, with an eccentricity of zero, you can see that this planet is, in fact, opening a gap in the disk. This is the, the surface density, kind of azimuthally averaged. And you can also play with the eccentricity. As you pump up the eccentricity of this planet, it actually is easier to open a wider gap. So you can decrease the mass of the planet slightly and still open a wide enough gap in about a million year time scale. OK. Now, this past summer, I had a paper on a really fascinating disk, which seems to have both of these things in it, both an eccentricity and multiple rings in it. So this is a system called HD53143. It's a pretty interesting system because it's basically an analog to our solar system. It's a sun-like star. 
but younger. It's only about a billion years old. So it's sort of like taking a look back at the potential evolution and dynamics of our own solar system's formation. So this system was imaged with Hubble, and this is the image in blue. It's not a particularly striking looking disk. It looks very different than the other disks I've been showing you. Can't really quite tell what's going on here. It was originally interpreted as being a face-on disk and that it actually had resonant clumps in it of emission, which causing these brightenings on two sides of the disk. But in overall, it's a pretty terrible image. So we imaged this with Alma, and it was a fascinating project to talk work on because I ran all these simulations for our ALMA proposal about this like resonant clump structure and then we actually got the data and I had to do a, a double take because it looks absolutely nothing like any model that I put into our proposal. Instead, this disk is highly eccentric. It's actually much more eccentric than the Fomalhaut disk. It's an eccentricity of 0.2. So this is the star. We have the same apocenter glow on one side and you can you know, see this huge offset between the disk center and the location of this star. Now it gets even more fun because we got new Hubble observations, and so now I'm overlaying the new STIS image on this, which looks better than the old STIS image, but is actually still quite different than the ALMA. If we model these disks with what we call a scale height, which is essentially the puffiness of the disk, the ALMA disk wants to be completely flat and highly eccentric, and the Hubble data actually doesn't favor having an eccentricity at all and wants to puff up the scale height to be quite large. Now, if we remember back, I said that different wavelengths of light are actually tracing different size grains. That would imply that the larger millimeter grains in this disk are doing one thing, possibly getting sculpted by a planet to be eccentric. And the optical light that is tracing these small dust grains that are doing something completely different. And so one you know, potential model is that we actually predict that for planetary stirring, you might puff up these small dust grains in your system, that they would get perturbed by the stirring of this planet and actually puff up the disk. The disk is even more interesting because we take our same modeling approach where we fit a model to the data. So what I'm showing here is the actual data, this model that we fit, which is just an eccentric ring model, the model image like the data, and the resulting residuals. And the contours here are three sigma, and there's quite a lot of excess emission left over when we fit this eccentric disk model. The dashed line here is basically showing where this outer edge, the inner and outer edge of the disk are, that outer eccentric disk. And all this excess emission is coming from inside. Now, that means that there's something that we're not accounting for in our model, and what seems to be the case is that if you look at this, it looks a little like those ansi that we just talked about with the donuts for this like edge on disk that had multiple rings. So what we think is going on is that there's actually a second disk in this system that has a higher inclination. And so now we have a disk that has sort of an asteroid belt analog and a Kuiper belt analog, but they're misaligned from each other. In our solar system, the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt are kind of nice and together. In this case, the Kuiper belt and the asteroid belt are kinked relative to each other. Um, what will be really interesting is I got time this cycle with Alma to actually go back and look at this with even higher resolution. So we'll get 1AU resolution observations, which should be able to definitively show what is actually causing this inner structure and resolve it. So we can test this for real. So if I look at this population of disks, what has become readily apparent with a decade of Alma observations is that substructure is common in almost every one of these disks we look at. There's sort of not a disk that we've tried to image with ALMA that doesn't have some kind of asymmetry or eccentricity or ring or gap structure to it. And if you take that and infer that they're all planets, we can update our planet semi-major axis diagram here. Same as before, but now all these colored symbols are the inferred planets from this sample of disks. And the black are our same solar system planets. So suddenly this whole side of the plot would be getting populated by a bunch of Neptune analogs. What I'm really excited about is we have a new Alma Large program that's going to get executed. It's actually already getting executed. We just got the first data this week where we're going to do D sharp but now for these more evolved debris disks. So we have about 200 hours of ALMA time to go and image a sample of a dozen different debris disks with high resolution 1AU structure to actually really look 
for this structure in these more evolved disks and try and probe whether they really are coming from planets. Okay, other angles that we can look at disks that are interesting. So there's been sort of a continual mystery of how we form hot Jupiters, these massive planets that are close to their star. One possibility is that they migrate, which would imply some kind of dynamical movement of these planets early in the system's history. And those kind of dynamics, things like cosi lidoff resonances, tend to excite inclinations and eccentricities of bodies. So we can actually use disks as a test for formation mechanisms and dynamical history by looking at the mutual inclination between the star and the disk. So my undergrad student wrote his honors thesis on this, um, where we actually tried to take test observations to measure stellar inclinations and compare it to the ALMA sample of all known debris disks and measure the difference between the stellar and the disk inclinations. People had tried to do this before and generally just kind of hand waved and said that they had mutual inclinations and everything was fine and everything was aligned correctly. In this case, the sources in red here actually have these really significant misalignments between the disk and the star. And so I think that this points to the case that debris disks maybe really aren't actually aligned with their host star, and that's gonna tell us some really interesting things about the dynamics of these systems. Now, of course, I've told this whole nice story about disks being sculpted by planets, and that's nice, and I really want that to be true, maybe, but there's a lot of other things that can create dynamics in systems, and so this is an example um, of a system called the MOTH, HD 61005, and it's called the MOTH because if you look at it, it actually has this structure where the disk is edge on, but it actually curves away from the midplane of the disk. It looks like it has wings. So there's grains getting pulled down out of the disk. And this is some work I've been doing with Anne-Marie Madigan at CU, who works in trying to run n-body simulations and is interested in sort of the collective self-gravity when you put a lot of dust particles in one place. And with this, we can actually excite this instability, which causes you to pull these grains out into a wing-like structure exactly like we see in this disk. So I highlight this to say that there's lots of other dynamics that could produce structures like wings and eccentricities that have nothing at all to do with planets. And to really understand what we can say about planets and what we can't, we need to look at these disks and model sort of their actual dynamics as well. Okay, so I'm gonna take an abrupt turn and focus now on stars. So we're gonna move away from thinking about ALMA, beautiful images of disks, and try and understand the activity from the star itself. Now why do we care about stars? They're often overlooked, but stars are active, our sun is active. They send out flares, these bursts of high energy radiation, and they send out charged particles, what we call a CME or a coronal mass ejection, and these can actually impact the planetary atmosphere, come in through the poles, and basically ionize and split apart molecules in the atmosphere. Now, on Earth, this is what causes our aurora, right? CMEs, charged particles actually entering the poles of our planet, cause these beautiful displays of light. But on M-dwarfs, these cooler stars that have higher magnetic field strains, this is much more dramatic. The flares are much larger, and so we actually think about these stars not only just creating aurora, but dissociating enough molecules and stripping away atmospheres that we can actually completely erode an atmosphere over time. Now, if stars flare across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, and different wavelengths of light are actually tracing, we think, different parts of our flare and different physical mechanisms of emission. So this is sort of the toy flare model here on the, right, on the left. We think of flares as being magnetic field loops, right, that thread through the photosphere of the star. The star is convecting, so those foot points where those loops thread through the star are actually moving around. As a result, they twist the field lines up, and eventually those fields snap when through what we call reconnection and reconnect into a loop that has a more regular magnetic field structure. And it's that snapping that causes the flare. The upper part of the flare loop is where we think we have synchrotron, actual emission and particle acceleration happening which we typically see in sort of longer radio emission and even in the ultraviolet. And then that propagates energy that heats down through the stellar atmosphere and actually heats the foot points, which glow really brightly as a black body emission. 
And this is sort of a, a nice example. This is a very short wavelength range, only from 100 to 1600 angstroms, and it's the sun. But even over that short wavelength range, you can see just the change in the structure of the emission in the same flare by tracing different wavelengths of light. So if we really want to understand flares, both their physics and also use that as an input to any atmospheric modeling, we need a multi-wavelength picture. Now, I got interested in flaring by looking at this one particular target, right, which is Proxima Centauri. So Proxima Centauri is our nearest star. It's an M-dwarf. And it has two, definitely maybe three, exoplanets orbiting it, one of which, Proxima Cen b, is everybody's favorite potential habitable exoplanet, because it's a roughly Earth-mass planet in the habitable zone of Proxima. So it's been studied a lot because it's our closest neighbor and it has this potentially habitable planet, so everybody wants to look at Proxima. So a group went and actually looked at Proxima with ALMA, trying to see whether it had dust around it. So it would be a multi-planet system with a Kuiper belt very similar to our own solar system. So they had about 10 hours of ALMA time, and what I'm showing on the left is if you take all those 10 hours of ALMA time and you just stack it together, like we typically do with disks. We just want to get the best sensitivity possible. There's a point source detected, and that point source had a flux that was in excess of what the stellar photosphere should be for an M-dwarf at 1.3 millimeter wavelength. And so they interpreted that as actually due to dust, where the star is heating the dust and it's glowing brightly, and so we see an excess in infrared wavelengths, I mean, millimeter wavelengths. So this was a really interesting thing, so I grabbed the data and I was like, I'm going to take a look at this. So remember, they have 10 hours of observations, and the first thing I did was to basically split the data up into the individual observations and look at them to see whether this was consistent across all the observations. If you take the first 12 of those observations, the first nine hours of data, you get this middle image, which looks different. There's basically nothing detected above two sigma here at all. And if you take the last observation, the 13th observation by itself, you get the right image, which now has a booming bright point source in it. So that would indicate that something is varying in time. Now we can do better with ALMA. ALMA has about a one second integration time. So we can actually split the data out into those individual one second integrations. And if you look at this last observation, in fact, there's almost nothing detected from the star for the majority of this whole observation, except for about two minutes, when suddenly the flare goes through this series of sort of small hiccups, and then this large burst where it brightens by a factor of almost 1,000, and then fades back down to nothing. That's not a disk, unfortunately. There's no disk in the system, but it was the first time that we'd actually detected flaring emission at millimeter wavelengths from an M-dwarf, which turns out to be really interesting and opens kind of an entirely new way of looking at stellar flaring and placing constraints on particle acceleration. But we'd never seen it before, so it was an important step to try and put that millimeter emission into context with the rest of the electromagnetic spectrum where we've observed flares a lot. So what I set up was a campaign where we went back to Proxima and we spent 40 hours of time observing it simultaneously with ALMA, several ground-based optical telescopes, TESS, Hubble, SWIFT, and Chandra so we could cover the entire millimeter all the way through X-ray part of the spectrum. Very hard to get all eight of these telescopes to actually observe the same target at the same time. There was a very long email thread with me and a bunch of telescope schedulers all trying to negotiate orbits. But if you manage to do this, you get some really beautiful data. So this is sort of a highlight. This was the brightest flare that we detected. And in fact, it's the brightest flare we've ever seen from Proxima Centauri to date. So stepping through this, this left panel is showing the multi-wavelength coverage in wavelength from longest with ALMA all the way down through TESS, DuPont, where we have H-alpha and helium-1 here, and then Hubble, both just sort of the continuum level from the star and focusing on the silicon-4 line, which is a known flare tracer. The right here is actually zooming in on just the ALMA data and the Hubble data to show the comparison of those two. So a few things to note about this flare. In ALMA and Hubble, it's an enormous flaring event. It brightens by a factor of nearly 15,000 
in the FUB Hubble band pass. And it brightens by a factor of more than 1,000 with ALMA. It's not very interesting in the optical, and I'll show that in more detail in the next slide. But it's quite small. And there's actually a noticeable delay between when we see the peak in the ALMA and the Hubble data and when we actually see the peak in the optical. And that's a significant delay. And what was even more surprising is how close the ALMA and the Hubble observations traced each other. This event is very short. Each of these is one second, so the entire thing is about eight seconds long. So the star brightens by a factor of 15,000 in eight seconds, and then it's gone. And these trace each other incredibly closely. And so I think that this is actually telling us something about the emission mechanisms here, where the, op the Hubble and the ALMA data are probably both tracing this sort of synchrotron radiation, where we're seeing the top of this flare loop, where we're actually accelerating particles. The optical could be delayed because it's coming from this sort of thermal heating, and it takes time for that initial energy burst to actually propagate downwards and heat the surface. Now, if this sort of pans out as an idea, then this may be very powerful, because right now we really want to know the high energy UV emission from stars. And it's very hard to do that. Our, pretty much our only facility right now is Hubble. And if we could use the millimeter, that's a lot easier. We might be able to say some interesting things about the high energy environments by tracing these sort of longer wavelength data. OK. So looking at the optical wavelengths again, these are what are called flare frequency distributions, where we actually plot the number of flares as a function of energy and amplitude here. These are all the flares that have been detected from Proxima using TESS and the EveryScope. These are much larger flares here, right? These are big flares. They occur very infrequently. These are small flares. And here is where this flare is that I just showed you with Alma and Hubble. So flares of this size in the optical make up about 75% of those flares. And we would predict, given these rates, that we should see a flare of that size like every day from Proxima. But it's huge with Hubble, right? It's a 15 octet of 15,000. But it's a pretty kind of run-of-the-mill optical flare. Now, we can even do more with the ALMA data, because ALMA doesn't observe at just one frequency. It actually observes across a band pass. So we can calculate a spectral index, how the flux of the star varies as a function of spectrum, spectral frequency. And ALMA also observes in the XX and YY polarizations, which means we can sort of reconstruct a Lomer limit on the fractional linear polarization of the flare. And so what I'm showing here is a collection of three flares, two from Proxima and one from AUMIC, another MDORF that we've been able to do this with with ALMA, where we've detected bright enough flares that we can piece out these spectral properties. So the top panels are all the light curves. In the middle panels are all the spectral indices as a function of frequency. And the bottom panel is that linear polarization index. And we're starting to see some trends where as we go into these flares, you actually see the spectral index become steeply negative. And we see the signature of change in the linear polarization fraction. So there seem to be some cumulative properties of these flares. What's perhaps surprising is that they're very different than what we see from our own sun. So there's a handful of solar flares that have been observed in the millimeter. And they show exactly the opposite, where the spectral index, instead of becoming negative, actually becomes positive, which is maybe puzzling. Now, we're starting to get enough of a sample that we can even do more with this, right? We can really start to make that solar stellar connection. So this is a new paper that my postdoc put out just this past month where we actually observed the first flare with Chandra and ALMA. So now we have x-ray optical in millimeter. This is a fascinating flare just because it actually is quite complex. It has multiple oscillations in it. It has a very different shape. And with this, we can start to take some comparisons to the sun. So this is showing the volume emission measure as measured from Chandra and the temperature. And you can see where this Proxima flare lies relative to comparable sized flares from the sun. The energy of this flare was roughly an X1 solar flare, which is a big solar flare, but still something that's actually comparable to our sun, unlike you know, these giant MDOR flares, which are orders of magnitude more energetic. And what's interesting on the right here is this is showing the Goodell-Benz relationships, which are well-known relationships for X-ray and long radio emission from stars. During quiescent, the millimeter seems to agree pretty well. But actually, during the flare, it seems to sort of step off this relationship. And so it's looking like these millimeter events are actually really extreme when we think about sort of the larger population of radio flares, which means they might be really interesting to explore, especially in the context of probing sort of the high energy particle acceleration of these events. Now, 
All I've shown are MDARs so far, but it turns out that sun-like stars flare too at millimeter wavelengths. This paper was just accepted yesterday from my grad student, um, Kiana, and we went and looked at archival ALMA observations of Epsilon Eridani, which people look at frequently because it has a disk, and it turns out that in those observations are three different ALMA flares. So we now see flares from a sun-like star at millimeter wavelengths. And this is HD 53143, which I already showed you that really cool, interesting disk. Turns out that star is active too. We were lucky in that Tess was observing this star at the exact same time as we were observing it with ALMA, completely by chance. And so the gray here is actually showing the Tess light curve, and you can see this huge spot modulation in it. And then this is the ALMA light curve over our eight ALMA observations. And you can see this huge spike up in the brightness of the star during one of the ALMA observations, which we think is probably a flare as well. If you calculate the spectral indices for this sun-like star sample, they're actually quite different. They have steeply positive spectral indices, more comparable to our sun-like sample of millimeter flares, and different than the MDORFs. So now we're starting to see this divergence between not only just millimeter flares being interesting in general, but maybe a difference between sun-like stars and MDORF stars in terms of where in the flare spectrum we're seeing this emission come from. So I think there's a lot of really exciting work to happen in the future with this because we don't have that much data at multi-wavelength flare studies, and we're sort of moving into this era of astronomy for like multi-messenger work where I think we'll be able to do a lot more. And so I've been working um, with Neil Turner at JPL on like thinking about a concept for a small explorer, SMEX, which we're currently calling SPEX, the Early Star and Planet Evolution Explorer, which would actually have near IR optical and NUV bands to observe simultaneously so we don't have to like fish around and ask a million telescopes to try and observe at the same time, which I think would be really interesting. And we're also moving into this era of doing lots of all-sky surveys, which will sort of do this by default. So some of the current CMB experiments, like SPT, have already found millimeter flares from really young MDORFs, things that are only a few million years old. So something like CMBS4, which will be coming online, is going to probably find tons and tons and tons of these events. So the foregrounds of these CMB experiments would be really fascinating to look at, especially in the context of other multi-wavelength surveys. Okay, I'm also really interested in pushing this to astrobiology, and so I've been starting to toy around with that, um, because it's one thing to try and understand these stars by themselves, but if we want to talk about exoplanet atmospheres and how damaging this is, we sort of need to actually quantify that. So one possibility, right, is modeling the changes to the atmospheres of these stars as a result of flares. And I'm working on a new project right now with a geneticist, actually, where we're going to try and recreate these flares in a lab and see whether flaring emission and UV radiation actually damages life. So right now we always say that, but we've never quantified it. So we're going to try and use UV flashbulbs in a lab to actually look at how much damage repeated UV radiation does to RNA and DNA. And we're also in this era now with JWST of thinking about biosignatures, right? We're taking the first observations of exoplanet atmospheres. People are starting to detect things like water and CO2 in exoplanet atmospheres. And on Earth, we often talk about the fact that oxygen is like a great biosignature. On Earth, if we look at the history of our atmosphere, there was basically no oxygen in the atmosphere of Earth until we got plants, and then we get this sudden jump up in oxygen. So people often think that oxygen might be great because it indicates that there's life on planets. But we're working on modeling, which shows that you could actually produce a significant column depth of oxygen just through flaring emission. Your flares come in and basically split apart things like water in your atmosphere. The hydrogen is light, so it can get easily stripped out. And what you're left with is a bunch of oxygen that has nothing left to recombine with it. So you can sort of completely amp up, this is showing oxygen pressure in bars in just the habitable zone as a function of stellar mass here in distance. You can get these huge amounts of oxygen and ozone in your atmosphere just by photochemistry. So as we start thinking about 
exoplanet atmosphere measurements and trying to interpret them, I would argue there's an especially critical need to do this kind of work to really know what the radiation environment is that's going to dictate your photochemistry so you can appropriately interpret what you're getting out of your spectra. Okay, so coming back to this, I want to keep looking forward a tiny bit on things that I've been working on because, you know, we've addressed two of these topics, but there's many more things on this slide. What else is particularly interesting here? We don't really understand the processing of volatiles through planet formation especially well. So I'm going to show this very complicated schematic. And it's meant to be complicated because disks are really complicated places. On the left is our protoplanetary disk. We see this flared structure. We have changes in the gas and grain and CO ratio as we cross through different ice lines, places where things freeze out in our disk. We have you know, a midplane, a temperature gradient vertically in this disk where the midplane is colder and we have more ice and then we have warm molecular layers on the surface here. Here is our debris disk population, which is thinner, but still has these changes in ice lines and chemistry and different populations of dust temperatures. This is a loose tracing of how we might use different wavelengths of light to trace different regions in our disk based upon temperature. And what I find even more striking is if you plop down all the known exoplanet orbits, they're all like here in this region where we're not tracing at all. Everything I showed you with ALMA is these kind of cold outer Kuiper belt analogs. There's a lot here. And while ALMA is amazing at letting us look at cold molecules and ice and Kuiper belt analogs, it is not getting us all the rest of this information that we need. And I think the answer to that is that we need telescopes in different wavelength spaces that we're missing right now. So in particular, the far IR, which we have no facilities in right now. Now, why do I say the far infrared? For a number of reasons, and I want to highlight a few of the big questions in planet formation science that I can't actually answer right now, and I will not be able to answer unless we have a future telescope. So one thing is, what mass do we have in these disks? With ALMA, we've been doing a lot of work to measure total dust masses and then total CO masses and infer dust to gas ratios and try and just measure the mass of a bunch of disks in young star forming regions as a function of age and look at trends in how disk mass evolves. The problem is, if I actually do those calculations and I look at the sample of disks that we've done this for, basically none of those disks have enough mass to form Jupiter. They all have masses, including all the dust and the gas, that are less than the mass of the giant planets in our solar system. That's a little bit uncomfortable because we clearly form giant planets. So the obvious answer is we're just probably wrong in how we're measuring the masses of planets. Because right now, we're using things like CO to try and trace the mass of H2, which is the bulk of the material in your disk. And CO could be optically thick. We don't really know the CO to H2 ratio. We typically assume what's in the ISM, but everything we look at in disk tells us that's probably not a good assumption. We need something else. And this is a pretty important question because it tells us how long we have to form planets. We see these structures. They're forming early. Planet formation has to start early. But we don't know how long we have because right now it looks like disk masses drop off really fast. And if they don't actually drop off really fast, then planet formation could go on for a lot longer than we think. Luckily, there's a potential answer for this, which is the molecule HD, which is deuterated hydrogen, which has two transitions at 56 and 112 microns. What I'm showing on the right here is TW Hydra, which is one of our best studied disks. The bottom is showing all of the masses that have been derived from this disk using various other tracers with ALMA. This is a logarithmic scale that spans several orders of magnitude, right? So this is not great agreement. This disk was one of the few targets that was targeted with Herschel when we had Herschel and measured HD in the disk. And these are the HD observations with Herschel. And they're much tighter, right? They're still scatter in that. And part of that is scaling between HD and H2, because they're still different molecules. And part of it is that for HD, we really need to know the radial location and the temperature of that gas in order to accurately derive a mass. 
there's a large degeneracy between whether you know where that gas is in the disk and what mass you get out of it. And so we would need even higher spectral resolution to be able to really resolve the profile of that line, determine the location of that gas, and then back out accurate dust ma gas masses, dust disk masses. And what I'm highlighting in purple is what we'd hope to achieve with sort of a new high resolution spectrometer on a far infrared telescope. Now, the other thing to highlight here is water, which is kind of the elephant in the room. We want to know how water ends up in planets. And we often draw this linear path from star formation into protostars, into disks, into comets. We don't actually know whether that's true. And the few observations we've made of water have actually shown differences in how much water we detect in the ISM versus in disks. It looks like we don't detect that much in disks. So maybe this inheritance isn't true. But we really can't say anything right now, because this is the lay of the water molecular transitions. So on the left is JWST. This is wavelength. On the right is ALMA. And there's one water line that's in the JWST band, and it is an incredibly hot, high energy transition of water. There is a couple in the ALMA bands, but we live on a planet with a water atmosphere above us. So while there may be transitions there, there are also the transitions of the water in the clouds outside. So we're not making any observations of exoplanet systems. And the red here is highlighting what we call the far infrared, this whole space between 30 microns and 500 microns, where there's just all these water lines that we're not probing right now. So this is a simulated spectrum of what a disk might look like in those water. We also have ice features, which are broader features. And we really need to go and look at disks to measure their water content to try and understand how that compares to the ISM. So we can try and start to understand whether chemistry really is inherited in this way, or that somehow we're actually restarting chemistry through this kind of initial disk formation process. So highlighting the fact that we need access to the far infrared part of the spectrum. And we can push that even further into trying to answer how Earth got its water by looking at cometary bodies. This is a typical plot showing D to H ratios, which is measuring the HDO deuterated water relative to H2O, normal water. And this is often used as a fingerprint of where your water population came from. So here's Earth, here's our other solar system planets, and then trying to compare between, say, asteroid populations and comet populations on whether Earth's water came for asteroids or comets. And right now, it looks like asteroids are better, but actually, we just don't have many comets that we've sampled. Comets are really hard to detect. They're faint. We haven't really, really, I'd argue that this is kind of just an upper limit on the water population in comets because we just haven't had the option to probe down to this level. So we could use you know, HDO and water to actually fingerprint and figure out where the water from Earth came from. So what I've been really kind of excited about and pushing on is that there's an opportunity now to maybe do this because NASA is soliciting for far infrared probe mission concepts, right? Which many people are probably familiar here because JPL has been working very hard on this. And if we could have a far infrared probe, then we might be able to answer some of these big questions. So I've also been working on this as part of a team for a program called FIRST, which is the Far Infrared Spectroscopic Survey Telescope, which I've been working as a deep deputy PI for. But PRIMA, which is being headed out of here, will also do this. And I think either one would be an awesome mission and allow us to actually do some really exciting science and make a huge impact in our understanding of planet formation. So I highlight that to sort of say, you know, we've done a lot now in planet formation, and I think we're going to do a whole lot more in the future. And I will put up a few takeaway messages, and then I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, the 
when we talk about eccentricity in disks, we have essentially two eccentricities. We have what's called the forced eccentricity, which is the global eccentricity of the disk, sort of what's being imparted on it by a potential planet. And then we have what's called the proper eccentricity, which is like a scatter in the orbits, because when I have orbits, they don't all need to be eccentric in the same way. They can all kind of scatter and change their orbital parameters. So you could use this change in width as a dynamical test if you have kind of a nice sculpted system, it's what we call an apsidal alignment, where I have eccentric orbits and I pinch them at pericenter. So something is sort of forcing them to have the same pericenter position, and the orbits essentially like nest like this. So they all have that same pericenter location, but they stretch out in the apocenter direction because they have slightly different semi-major axes. This produces a pretty large width difference because you end up having a pretty big difference at apocenter because of all these orbits sort of stretching like this, and you end up having a really narrow pericenter point because they've gotten pinched. You can do more fun and extreme things. If you pump up the proper eccentricity, you can actually even out this because instead of this nesting, now all your orbits are starting to like scatter around randomly, and so you can end up producing the same width but in a globally eccentric disk. And if you look at like the rings of our solar system planets, like Saturn has an eccentric ring. And in that case, it has this huge like seven to one width difference or something like that between epicenter and pericenter that we actually think comes from like self-gravity and this kind of dynamics of bodies interacting with each other. But whatever we measure the width difference to be would allow us to basically probe that. On all the nearby uh, hours on. Yes. Yeah. So I have been kind of trying to slowly build this catalog. So we, I show the results from Proxima. We have a new campaign that's happening right now where we took the next four closest M stars and are doing the same monitoring. So we have Alma and Nicer and Swift. Um, it's hard to do these sort of campaigns right now because you're sort of like trying to step into a sample by going one by one. Um, to really do it well, I think we need all sky surveys. We need to move to the point where we can do something like a large program with ALMA, where we can not just cherry pick one or two stars, but try and do many stars. Um, something I'm also pretty excited about is that we're gonna try to maybe, hopefully, <laughs> execute a campaign where we observe with SWIFT at the same time as JWST is doing transmission spectroscopy of exoplanet atmospheres, so that we have simultaneous observations of the stellar high energy flux while you're measuring the chemistry of your atmosphere. Because I can do these statistics and tell you rates of flares, but that doesn't mean that you know exactly what the star is doing at the time that you measure an atmosphere. By doing that, even if the star doesn't flare, you'd have the high energy flux from the star to be able to like model photochemistry. And if you observe the same targets over and over again, you'd actually could even look for variations in the atmosphere composition as a function of the stellar activity. So we're gonna try and execute that in cycle one and see whether it works or not. Um, but I think that there's a larger acknowledgement from the community that doing this monitoring work is really critical for us to actually be able to get maximum information out. Oh, so for the disk where we see the ALMA data be sort of flat and the, op the Hubble data is puffy. Yeah, so that is the first disk that we have ever seen that in. <laughs> um, 
there have absolutely been theoretical models that say that if disks are getting stirred by planets, we would expect to see changes in the scale height, what we call the thickness of the disk as a function of grain size. We've never actually observationally seen that before, um, but that should be the case. Uh, and I think the other part of your question was what kind of observations do we need to look for that? Um, yeah, so we essentially can look at grain size changes by looking at any kind of range of different wavelengths. Um, so if we split between something that's thermal emission, say the far infrared or the millimeter or the radio, we're probing these larger grains, and we think that those larger grains are basically more gravitationally bound into the disk. The whole picture of debris disks is that it's collisional. Small dust gets removed from systems really quickly. And so if we see this any size dust in these systems, we must have comets that are colliding and grinding and basically producing this cascade of smaller dust sizes. Um, anything that's in the scattered light regime, we're tracing these smaller dust grains. So we really, to test that, would just need to observe disks in different wavelengths of light. And I showed a lot of examples because we have, you know, a lot of these same disks have been imaged with Hubble and imaged with Alma, which is probing the same sort of thing, but we just haven't seen that before. A good question. Yeah, so I think what's interesting with Alma is that initially we were approaching it kind of like stamp collecting in that this was an amazing new facility and we wanted to look at individual targets that for some reason or another we thought would look weird, you know, like FOMO hot clearly was probably going to look weird. And so let's go look at it with Alma and get this amazing image of this cool dynamical disk. Right now, what's been really interesting with Alma is that after 10 years, we've kind of done the stamp collecting. All of those disks have been imaged. And now people are starting to do these large surveys where you can actually get the time. Because just looking at FOMO hot doesn't tell me about how planet formation happens as a whole. So if we look at 20 disks, I can actually start to look at trends. So I think we're sort of in the realm of all the large programs right now. In terms of future developments, they are planning to add more antennas and increase the bandwidth and increase the different frequency bands that are available. So pushing into longer wavelengths and into shorter wavelengths and then trying to increase sort of the instantaneous bandwidth that you can look at any one time to try and trace multiple molecular lines all at the same time. Because right now, if you want to look at, say, 12CO and 13CO and C18O, you have to go back and look three different times to tune to get different lines. And so with an increase in bandwidth, you'd be able to simultaneously look at CO and CN without having to come back multiple times. There's an ALMA 2030 which is fun to think about because the time that we have all these new facilities coming online, we should also have new ALMA capabilities, hopefully. Right, so we're past the hour. Let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>